been thinking and writing about happiness for years. And lately I've turned my focus to habits because I realized that habits are like the prequel to a happy life. If you have habits that work for you, you are much more likely to be happy, healthy, productive, and creative. And if you have habits that don't work for you, then it's gonna be more of a struggle. And I began to think very hard about a certain aspect of habits, about adopting habits, because of two conversations that I had. One was with an old friend who said, it's funny, when I was on the track team in high school, I never missed a track practice, but I can never make myself go running on my own. And then I was talking to a guy at South by Southwest who said, well, you know, I have my own business. I have to have my own business. I always want to do what I want to do. And I said, yeah, but you've got your own business. There's got to be a lot of stuff that you have to do that you don't want to do. What do you do about that? And he said, actually, it's a really big problem for me because I only want to do what I want to do. And I know it limits my business. And this got me started to thinking about how people respond to the ideas of rules and how they respond to habits. Now, most of us have had the experience of trying to adopt a good habit or squelch a bad habit. It turns out that it is very important to know yourself and your own nature when you're trying to do this. People are very different from each other. When you're trying to adopt a habit, you're trying to impose a behavior on yourself. You're trying to give yourself a rule. And people respond very differently to the idea of rules. And by rules, I also mean habits, demands, expectations, requests, anything like that. Now, I think that people fall into one of four categories, which reminds me of that old joke that the world is made up of two kinds of people, the kind of people who like to divide the world into two kinds of people, and the kind of people who don't. Um, and I am definitely in the former category. And in this situation, I believe that there are four categories of how people respond to the idea of rules. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through briefly the four categories. Then I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and to identify what category you think best describes you. And then I'm gonna go through the four categories a little more deeply so that you can be thinking about yourself, or the people that you work with or who are close to you and how uh, you might think about the implications of their category when you're trying to work together. But here is a note of caution. Whenever I talk about the categories, I often get the sense that some people are deciding that one category is the best category or one category is the category that everybody ought to belong to and people are trying to cram themselves into that definition. Like anything having to do with self-knowledge, this exercise will only be successful if you are honest with yourself. Each of these categories has pros and cons. Each of these categories includes people who have been super successful and big, big losers. So be truthful. Now, these categories have to do with how you respond to the idea of a rule. And a rule can be an external rule which is something like deadlines, doctor's orders, a request from a sweetheart, or it can be an inner rule, your New Year's resolution, your decision to write a novel in your free time. So how do you respond to the idea of inner rules and outer rules? First is the upholder. The upholder responds very readily to outer rules and inner rules alike. They meet the deadline, they keep the New Year's resolution. Next are the questioners. Questioners question all rules, but if they think a rule makes sense, they will follow it. Next, rebels. The rebel resists all rules, outer rules and inner rules alike. And finally, the obligers. Obligers respond readily to outer rules, but they struggle to impose rules on themselves. So now let's go through the categories. Who here would say that they're an upholder? I am an upholder, 100% upholder. How many upholders? Okay, how many people, okay, and about questioners, let me say this. 
Questioners often come with a tendency towards upholding or a tendency towards rebelling. So they, questioners come in a couple different flavors. Who here would describe themselves as a questioner? Okay, now the rubble. And finally, obligers. Yeah. Hey, yeah. we'll get to that. Um, this is very interesting because in my experience, the two, rebel is the smallest category, upholder is the second smallest category, and questioners and obligers are the two largest categories and I can never really figure out which is the very largest category. So this audience is pretty representative of that. So now I wanna go through and talk about each of the categories. So you can think about, well, if you're in this category, how could you motivate yourself better? How could you create structures that will allow you to succeed? And when you're thinking about other people, how can you motivate them? And how can you create structures that are gonna help them succeed? Because so much of what we do is dependent on other people. So first is the upholder. And again, they respond out to outer rules and inner rules. So upholders are very motivated by fulfillment. Both the fulfillment in the simple way, like the store fulfilled the order, check. And also by fulfillment in the sense of that warm feeling of accomplishment that you get from achieving something. That's what upholders respond to. They very much want to know the rules and what's expected of them. They want to avoid making mistakes, getting blamed, or letting people down. And significantly, they or include themselves. They do not want to let themselves down. They have a very strong sense of obligation to their own rules. So an upholder wakes up and thinks, what's on the to-do list today? What's on the schedule today? Let's start checking it off. So what are the pros and cons of being an upholder or of working with an upholder? It's pretty clear. Compliance, learning the rules, sticking to the rules, that's what upholders like to do. And they are very good at self-starting. If they say they're gonna do something, they're gonna do it. They don't need a lot of supervision. They don't need a lot of accountability. They also are very good sometimes at seeing the rules beyond the rules. They are very interested in learning the rules, but they're also thinking, well, what are the rules that no one's even seen yet? So in something like, <laughs> like art or ethics, they're looking for the rules beyond the rules. What are the cons of being an upholder or working with an upholder? Well, they're the dark side of the pros. Upholders can be very rigid. They can be very constrained by the rules because they don't want to break those rules. And in fact, they're sometimes paranoid. They're so worried about breaking rules, they may be being obedient to rules that don't even exist. <laughs> they can sometimes be overwhelmed and paralyzed if they're in an environment where the rules are ambiguous or where there are no rules. Now sometimes an upholder can be great in that situation because they'll help figure out what the rules should be, but sometimes they don't know what to do. And there's a relentless quality to upholders that can be very draining for people around them. Upholders have a certain idea of how people should behave and how they should behave and they're gonna do it and they really don't have a lot of sympathy for people who are not on that train. And I think sometimes about my law school roommate, an upholder, who I think told me she had skipped going to the gym five times in the last three years. That's an upholder. <laughs> the questioner. And as I said, questioners can be upholder tendency or rebelling tendency. They'll follow the rules if the rules make sense. So questioners are motivated by sound reasons. Why? They must decide for themselves that something makes sense. And they will not follow rules with which they do not agree or which they think are arbitrary. A questioner wakes up and thinks, what needs to get done today? So what are the pros and cons of questioners? Well, questioners are very intellectually engaged. Why, 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 why? They wanna understand. They can be very healthy for organizations because they're the ones who say, why are we doing it this way? Why are we writing this at all? And if they believe a rule makes sense, they will follow it. The cons. If they don't think it makes sense, they're not gonna follow it. <laughs> and they may not bother to tell you. <laughs> you know, you say, hey, I thought I told you that that was due on Friday. And they said, well, you didn't, I, I don't think you need that till Wednesday, so you'll get it Tuesday night. <laughs> or they might say, my doctor told me to take this heart pressure medication, but it's expensive and I don't feel any different, so I'm not gonna take it. 
Questioners can also sometimes be paralyzed if they feel like they see arguments on both sides or if they feel like they don't have perfect information. So their need for information can sometimes trip them up. And being questioners can be exhausting. Why, 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 just do it already. <laughs> and questioners themselves will say that they feel exhausted by their own need to constantly understand and to question and to prove that what they're doing is the right thing. And also, for questioners, and this is true for all the categories, the fit is very, very important. Because if you have a certain tendency and you're in a job that's not right for that tendency, it can be a big problem. For instance, I was talking about these categories with somebody and he said, oh my god, now I know why I hate my job. <laughs> I'm a questioner and I'm a tax accountant. <laughs> so being a tax accountant would be a great job for an upholder because it's all about the rules and following the rules and that'd be enormously fulfilling. But for someone who's like, why is it this way? Why is it that way? Why are we doing it this way? Why is the law written in this way? Drove him crazy. So it was a bad fit. Next, the rebel. Resist outer rules and inner rules alike. Rebels are motivated by present desire. They want to do what they want to do. And if you ask them or tell them to do something, not only will they not do it, they are very likely to want to do the opposite. They resist all control. Importantly, even self-control. They do not give themselves rules. They want to do what they want to do. They choose to act from a sense of freedom. And they do love to flout the rules. But interestingly, rebels can sometimes be winkled into doing things with certain trains of thought, certain frameworks of doing something. One of the most, uh, most frequent is, I'll show you. I don't think you could train for a marathon. I'll show you. Um, I don't think you can get into an Ivy League school. I'll show you. That's a friend of mine. Biggest rebel in the world, but she rebelled her way right into Harvard. Um, <laughs> or, I'm not going to take out the trash every night because you want me to, but I will choose to do it out of love for you. <laughs> so rebels wake up and think, what do I want to do today? Now, what are the pros and cons of a rebel? Again, it's pretty obvious once you see the category. So rebels are not constrained by the rules. They're happy to break the rules. They get a kick out of breaking the rules. So they can think outside the box. They can do things that other people don't feel comfortable doing or wouldn't even think of doing because they're these rebels. And they, have, they want to do what they want to do, so they have a high level of engagement because they're doing what they want to do. What are the cons? Well, it can be frustrating to work with somebody who doesn't want to do what you ask them to do or tell them to do, and who very likely may want to do just the opposite. You know, and with some rebels, it's to the point where you're like, hey, read this book, you're going to love it. They're like, I, I'm not going to take it. I don't want it. I hate it. You know, this is a rebel thing. I'm not going to do it because you tell me to. And even rebels themselves will talk about the difficulty of managing this tendency in themselves. Because every time they try to give themselves a habit, give themselves a rule, they immediately resist it. So unless they can get themselves in the frame of mind that I talked about earlier, find a way to do it. It's very hard for them to stick to it because they resist all control, even self-control. Next, the obliger. They can do the outer rules. They have trouble with the inner rules. Obligers are very motivated by external accountability. In a way, this is the category where it's easiest to like, account for it, just you know, structurally. 
They find it very difficult to fulfill an obligation to themselves, but they really hate letting other people down. They're very, very motivated to do what's expected of them. And so, as a consequence, exactly as you would predict, they respond very readily to external structures of accountability. Things like deadlines, coaches, partners, trainers, late fees. They're often very motivated by their own responsibility as a role model, and even to just simply being monitored is a form of accountability. So obligers wake up and think, what's expected of me today? So what are the pros and cons? Pros, it's great to work with an obliger. They're gonna do what they say they're gonna do. They're very reliable. They're great for the team. For the obliger, really, the cons fall most heavily on the obligers themselves. And obligers know this. They will often say things like, I'm a people pleaser. Or why is it that I can do everything to meet other people's demands and expectations and needs and desires, and yet I can never take time for myself? They feel that. They don't have a counterbalancing obligation to themselves. And as a result, they're very susceptible to burnout because they will push and try and say yes to other people, but they won't pull back and take care of themselves. And so they're very likely to burn out. And also, they're not good at self-starting um, because, let's say they're in, ac in academia. There's no one saying like, how about this week? Have you been working on your PhD thesis? Or have you been going to those lunches to network with your future colleagues? No one's checking on them, so it doesn't get done. So they're not good at things that, are self, are, that are, have to do with self-starting. So the last thing that I would say about these categories is that once you see how people fit together, it's much easier to, to figure out for yourself or for others how you might create circumstances that would help people succeed, get done what they need to do, and keep the habits that they want to keep, and, um, and the circumstances in which they can thrive. Because as with everything related to happiness and habits and just about everything else, the secret is self-knowledge. The better you know yourself, your own nature, your own interests, your own value, your own temperament, the better able you are to bring these elements into your everyday life and therefore to be happier. So thank you. Thank you.